Reshuffled the, the deck, and we're going to hear from Borislava uh, Manojlovic, who's a uh, director of research and a PhD student at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. That's the one in Northern Virginia, is that right? Yes. Excellent, I've been there. And focusing on history of education, dealing with the past, memory and reconciliation, and is a conflict resolution practitioner. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hear from her today on the topic of dealing with contentious past memory and education in post-conflict Croatia. Thank you. So uh, my study uh, is part, actually, it's a snapshot of, of my dissertation. Uh, and uh, I'm exploring historical memories of uh, mass violence uh, that emerged from the processes of uh, Croatian state and nation formation, war and transition towards peace, with focus particularly on Croat and Serb communities, school communities in Eastern Slavonia. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the background of the conflict. Uh, it's very brief. Uh, ethnic conflict in Croatia emerged in the wake of Yugoslavia's disintegration in 1991. Uh, parties, uh, main parties were Croats and Serbs, um, uh, having different claims. Uh, the war ended in 1995 with the Erdut Agreement, and uh, there was around uh, 20,000 casualties uh, from this conflict, uh, resulting in this conflict. Um, which is a significant number considering that Croatia is a, is a relatively small country of 4 million people. So even 17 years after the war has ended, the communities of former Yugoslavia and communities in Croatia are, are still undergoing this painful process of facing the past, uh, while reconciliation and positive peace remains elusive. So why did I decide to, to study this topic? Uh, school communities, uh, and by that I mean uh, parents, students, uh, teachers, uh, school administration, um, school communities and education system in post-conflict societies often serve uh, as places where narratives of different groups clash and cause contention, especially in history classes. So um, education systems and schools uh, can actually serve as, as repositories of conflict. Uh, and my question and my research is about how, how they can serve as repositories of peace. So uh, the other reason why I decided to study this topic is that memory, and I think that memory and history can have a very concrete and uh, significant impact on the ways in which post-conflict societies function. Uh, so my case study is uh, exploratory rather than causal. So. Uh, my goal was to gain deeper understanding of the key case. Uh, and uh, there is a very interesting uh, situation, very interesting spatial variation in the case of Eastern Slavonia, which is a geographical region in Croatia, in the, in the eastern uh, part of Croatia. And this spatial variation is that there are uh, integrated and segregated models of schooling. Um, so data is uh, acquired through interviews with students um, and uh, uh, also uh, analysis of the textbooks, history textbooks, uh, to, to gain insights into the official discourse uh, of the past. Uh, and by uh, this study, we'll actually explore this discursive interaction between official historical discourses and individual stories on the ground. So. In this way, uh, we'll get insight into the living memory, into what is legitimate and correct according to the participants of this study, which are in this case students, and how this influences their views of self, other, and uh, the relationship between the two. So here's, here's a short overview of my findings so far. Um, historical memories operate at different levels, and they represent structures that are not only constitutive of our individual selves, but they're actually constituted by ourselves to fit our particular views of reality. So the key premise is that individuals are able to construct, imagine, and live their own histories by retelling the past in various <coughs> relational contexts. So I introduced the concept of uh, uh, relational power of individuals in memory production. Uh, I'm saying that memory is a relational phenomenon and its objects and topics emerge out of networks and interplay of various actors co-creating and selecting memories 
uh, to gain relevance that gain relevance through interaction. The production of memory should not only be seen, therefore, as a, as a top-down approach, but also as a bottom-up process in which discourses of the past emerge and evolve through these relational dynamics uh, of various actors. So memories are operationalized through discourses of the past that acquire meanings relationally. If uh, an utterance, a statement that a person makes is not recognized by the other person as, a me as meaningful, such a utterance doesn't have validity. Uh, it is placed in the realm of absurdity. It cannot be heard. Uh, it is reduced to non-existence. So in conflict situation, uh, which is my field of study, conflict analysis and resolution, there is often an almost uh, impenetrable wall that is erected by those uh, who are incapable of hearing the other's story. Uh, because these stories exist uh, outside their reality, outside their accepted norms and values. So in conflict, there is often a very limited array of discursive possibilities that are in use, while the rest is uh, condemned to oblivion, absurdity, and silence. So. Speaking in Foucauldian language, having power over discourses means having power over knowledge, agency, and in temporal terms over past, present, and future. So those who stand outside the mainstream discourse are usually those that are marginalized, uh, that are oppressed, or silenced. So these, these people are in a way deprived of, of future. Um, so although this line is, is kind of common in the field of conflict resolution and conceptually it is intriguing, uh, it may still oversimplify the intricate, intricate currents of agency at the interpersonal level. Uh, and to support that argument, uh, the findings of this study show that people at the gra grassroots, regardless of their ethnicity, do not really replicate dominant historical discourses. So this study explores these places where discourses from above and individual narratives meet because I feel that these places um, um, we can actually trace some possibilities of dealing with contentious past in constructive ways. So why is this happening? Why, why don't students replicate those official dominant discourses? Well, um, education systems um, represent organized systems that, that promote certain coda rules, regulations that are mainstream from above, through curricula, through textbooks. Um, and uh, these, these social practices are supposed to be unifying and cohesive. However, actors within those systems, primarily students, are not only influenced by CODA and practices in schools, but also at home, in their families and in their communities. So educational CODA and practices are often external and kind of non-organic interrupters in, the, in this milieu of actual uh, communities. So when discourses of the past uh, promoted through such system reach <coughs> individuals, they go through a process of adaptation through interaction. So we can see in, no, through my study that uh, a perfect example of human to human, how human to human intera uh, uh, interactions within these two communities in Eastern Slavonia lead to different participants' views uh, pertaining to history and, me and memory. Uh, so are there any differences in integrated and segregated models? Well, I found some, some commonalities in integrated and segregated model. Uh, history and nation-building narratives seem to be more important to Croatian students' ethnic and national identity, while Serb students find history important for delineating their membership to a wider cultural and historical corpus rather than political entity, which is not surprising uh, because Serbs are defining their identity in relation to their genealogies and nations that live dispersed and outside the borders of their motherland which made their position uniquely different and difficult to fit into the newly created nation states. So on the other hand, uh, students also, uh, in, in their narratives, there, there, there are human rights and justice discourses, um, regardless of ethnicity. So these human rights and justice discourses are more related to respondents' inquiry 
into the accountability and responsibility of their respective in-groups for acts perpetrated uh, against the out-groups in, in the recent war. So they, they occur with both ethnic groups. Um, and what's interesting is that participants uh, tend to use similar logic, similar phrases and metaphors to, to reflect on, on their in-group's accountability for actions taken during and after the war. So this, this suggests, this, this kind of converging points um, or common ground points suggest that this discourse may provide some entry points that may lead to, to transformation of actually these entrenched positions and dichotomous um, us versus them positions that, that actually exist in, in, in official discourses uh, that are made here from above. Um, in segregated model, uh, on the other hand, there is a sense of frustration and inadequacy in dealing with the contentious past among the participants from both groups. So the attitude of, of students is that, uh, regardless of ethnicity, uh, is that the only way to reclaim their agency is to break away from history and public discourses of the past. So they, they totally reject history as something that is not important, that at least that's what they say. So the students are in this way refusing to be constantly reminded about this contentious history which does not contribute in any way to normalization, but actually contributes to renewed tensions, radicalization, which is, which is particularly prevalent in the, in the segregated model of schooling. Um, so while history should serve as a reminder of the past, an educational tool, it is often misused in the public discourse in schools to exacerbate divisions. Um, so let me conclude. Uh, the proposition of this study uh, is that, ra uh, that uh, rather than focusing on the workings of memory from above, that charter and constrain individual agency. We need to shift our focus uh, on the ways people become authors of their own destinies through their authentic production of history in interaction with others. So the focus should for for a moment shift on people's everyday choices uh, that enable them to dissent from the collective discourses and script of the past, scripts of the past. So people should be recognized as historical agents. And the only way to do that is by exploring originality of their actions that are always in the making and interwoven in relationships with others. So what emerged from my exploration of Eastern Slavonia case study is a realization that dealing with the past is a communal and interpersonal process which requires dedicating involvement of all relevant levels and structures from students, parents, teachers, to ministry officials and civil society. Um, the value of fostering this respectful, uh, friendly, and caring relationships through interactive learning about history can actually be a key for societies that are trying to navigate their way out of the historical cycles of violence. So key thing, it is necessary for people on the ground to own the process, to belong and believe in the possibility of truly integrated communities. So, integrated uh, schooling model does not mean that these communities are really integrated. So to believe in the possibility of truly integrated communities that will not be imposed from the outside, but will emerge from within. Okay, thank you.